Good day, everyone, and welcome to Ready, Set, Go, a webinar series sponsored by HUD's Office of Special Needs Assistance Programs, known as SNAPS. I'm John Maga. I work at the National Center on Family Homelessness, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. On behalf of SNAPS, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us. Today's webinar is Implementing the HEARTH Act, the Emergency Solutions ESG Program. Next slide, please. Today we'll be featuring the following presenters. Michael Roanhaus is the Director of the Program Coordination and Analysis Division within the SNAPS office. He directs the Emergency Solutions Program, helps manage the HPRP program, and oversees policy on the homeless elements of the Consolidated Plan, HMIS, and the Point in Time and Housing Inventory Counts. Susan Ziff is HUD's HPRP and ESG team lead. Additionally, we have two virtual help desk representatives or resource advisors on the line with us to answer your content questions. Brett Gagneau, also with SNAPS, has been instrumental in providing assistance in the development of the regulations in support of the HEARTH Act. And Janet Pershing is a project manager at ICF who provides technical assistance on a number of HUD programs, including ESG. Next slide, please. Before we begin, I'd like to make a couple of logistical announcements. Today's webinar will last approximately one hour and is being recorded. The webinar recording and the PowerPoint presentation will be posted next week on the HUD HRE website at www.hudhre.info. As an attendee of this webinar, your microphone will be automatically muted. Next slide, please. We recommend using your phone rather than your computer speakers to hear the audio for today's presentation. And due to the large number of attendees, there may be a slight delay in the advancement of the slides. If you experience any other technical difficulties, please request assistance by using the questions box in your GoToWebinar toolbar. Next slide, please. Now at any point during the webinar, if you have a question, please refer to the questions pane located on the toolbar to the right of your viewer pane. By clicking in the dialog box of the questions pane, you as an attendee have the ability to send questions to the resource advisor for this webinar. All of your questions are important to us. However, we will not have time to answer every single question. If you are unable to respond, if we are unable to respond to your question live, then please submit it to HUD's virtual help desk at the web address on your screen www.hre.info slash helpdesk. Next slide, please. The questions box is also the place you can submit your content questions. All of your questions are important, but we may not be able to address all of them. Again, uh, if, if we don't address them in this webinar, the virtual help desk will be able to respond. Please remember to reference this presentation, Implementing the HARF Act, the Emergency Solutions Grant ESG program in your questions. We'll also send you a brief webinar evaluation at the email address through which you registered for today's webinar. Please respond to the evaluation so we can continue to improve the delivery for future webinars. Next slide, please. Now a brief feedback survey of this webinar will be emailed directly through through the email to which you registered, as we've mentioned. We greatly appreciate your help in that evaluation. As a reminder, you will remain muted throughout the call, but can submit any questions, again, via the GoToWebinar toolbar on your screen. Next slide, please. Pre presenters will cover three topics on today's webinar. One, an overview of ESG priorities, two, ESG requirements, and lastly, frequently asked questions regarding ESG. Next slide, please. Now HUD has been giving variations of this presentation in person around the country, and there is some new and updated information that they wanted to make available to everyone. Also, as programs are starting to get off the ground, HUD wanted to provide an overview of some of the key requirements 
to ensure that people are implementing ESG, that those people implementing ESG understand the program correctly. Upon completion of this webinar, participants will be able to do three things. One, understand the budget context in which HUD's homeless programs and ESG are operating. Two, have an increased understanding of key requirements for ESG. And lastly, improve their ability to implement ESG. Next slide, please. And with that, I'd like to turn this over to our first presenter, Mike Roanhouse. Mike? Thank you, John, and good afternoon, everybody. Let's do a short budget recap on 2012 and potential 2013 funding. The President's fiscal year 2012 budget request was $2.372 billion, well short of the amount needed to fully fund all the HEARTH initiatives. Congress scaled back the request to $1.9 billion for fiscal year 2012. The ESG program budget minimum was set by Congress at $250 million, but the administration added $36 million to this amount for a total of $286 million. Moving to fiscal year 2013's budget. Next slide. The fiscal year 2013 request was $2.23 billion with $1.94 billion for the COC program and $286 million for ESG and $5 million set aside for the rural program. $75 million was set aside for the continuation of the HUD-BASH program. Next slide. The President's budget was committed to meeting the goals of open doors, the federal strategic plan to prevent and end homelessness. In 2013, HUD would seek to tailor specific existing programs to be t targeted and to be more efficient, implement innovative strategies, and focus on utilizing mainstream resources and benefits for homeless persons. Next slide. This slide shows the current status of legislative action on the fiscal year 2013 appropriation. There are significant differences between the House and Senate versions. However, the ESG program stays the same or decreases slightly between the current two House versions. However, the two fiscal year 2013 13 HUD, an ESG budget will be affected potentially by the so-called sequestration process. Next slide. The 2013 budget is the subject, subject to the Budget Control Act of 2011. The act requires a $1.2 trillion reduction from fiscal year 2013 to 2021 a $109 billion reduction each year. Failure by Congress to make the necessary reductions will result in automatic funding cuts as detailed in the Act. Next slide. The Sequestration and Transparency Act of 2012 required the President to submit proposed funding cuts. So in September, OMB submitted a report to Congress outlining the impact of sequestration cuts on 1,500 budget accounts. The Homeless Assistance Grant account would re be reduced by 8.2% or $156 million. The Homeless Assistance Grants count would be reduced to $1.745 billion in fiscal year 2013 from that $1.9 billion in fiscal year 2012 base year. This process will take place either in September with a lame duck Congress or with a new Congress in January. And nobody really knows just how this process will wind up, um, but there are a set of given 
cuts that have been specified by law, and uh, we'll see what happens. Next slide. The bottom line is there'll be increasingly pressure on local homeless service systems combined with constricting resources potentially, requiring us to retool programs to achieve greater efficiency and effectiveness. Next slide. First, I'd like to talk about some broad congressional emphases in the HEARTH Act and re re recent appropriation actions prior to 2013 and the sequestration process I went through. First, there was more funding for, new, for the new emergency solutions concepts. There were limits on spending new funds on street and shelter. There was a new emphasis on rapid rehousing program and diversion from shelters and street, and uh, a focus on uh, a revised homeless prevention program. There was an emphasis on an enhanced coordination between the COC and ESG programs, and enhanced planning and collaboration between 432 COCs and 50 state Puerto Rico and 1,137 metropolitan cities and urban counties and four territories consolidated planning processes. Next slide. Turning to some of the guiding values in terms of our regulation development. One of the guiding values we have was having the HEARTH Act program serving people who are homeless in a way that works best for them ensuring the system works as well as it can. The ESG regulations provided communities flexibility to determine how to address critical homelessness in their own community. ESG recipients and COCs have the responsibility to assess their own program's effectiveness and system's effectiveness at addressing homelessness needs. Con-plan jurisdictions with or without ESG funding need to evaluate their own and their sub-recipient performance, getting the system to effectively address homeless needs. Next slide. We emphasize comprehensive, local, collaborative coordination and decision making with the flexibility to design programs to effectively meet the needs of each community. ESG recipients must work collaboratively with COCs to make decisions about ESG and COC funding within the COC's geographical areas. Develop written standards for evaluating and serving homeless persons and implementing a centralized and coordinated assessment system. Also create performance standards and evaluate projects against those standards. Additionally, we must be collaborating and coordinating with mainstream supportive services in housing funded through other HUD programs as well as through other federal agencies. Next slide. Another guiding value is data collection and performance. HUD's homeless performance programs have become performance driven. You will note that the HEARTH Act as well as the program regulations have an increased focus on data collection and performance. The use of HIMS is required for all recipients of COC and ESG funds except for victim service providers. ESG recipients and COC should use HMIS data locally to report to HUD, monitor recipient and sub-recipient performance, and set up a modest monitoring system-wide performance system in preventing and ending homelessness. HUD will use HIMS data to understand the nature and extent of homelessness throughout the country, report to Congress, and make funding decisions. Next. The performance of ESG recipients and their funding of local emergency shelter systems will play an important role in COC performance in regard to several potential areas of measurement, including the length of time in homelessness, recidivism, access and coverage, i.e. thoroughness in reaching persons who are homeless, 
An overall reduction in the number of persons who experience homelessness, job and income growth for persons who are homeless, and a reduction in first-time homelessness. Next slide. As we developed the ESG regulation, we were focused on achieving several key things. Broadening the activities available to help people who are on the street and offering more flexible prevention services to avert homelessness, emphasizing rapid rehousing, which is one of the Secretary's priorities, focusing on permanent housing solutions and the supports necessary to achieve stability, assigning ESG to the extent possible, aligning, I'm sorry, ESG to the extent possible with other HUD programs such as CDBG, HOME, and Housing Choice Vouchers, as well as other targeted homeless programs such as the COC, and the Rural Homeless Housing Stability Program to, push, to support coordinated plans and reduce administrative burden. We sought to structure ESG's components and activities in a way that will streamline reporting to support coordinated and effective reporting and data collection and allow for performance measure and program evaluation across the two major homeless programs. Next slide. If the congressional increases in ESG funding was intended to be some kind of a follow-up funding for the loss of the $1.5 billion HPRP program funds that were to spent roughly over three years, then many of you have to think about the following things. You have to target carefully to devote resources to the population in greatest need. This means tailoring resources to house households in the greatest needs to make each dollar go as far as it can and serve more people. You have to think strategically about limited resources. Focus more funds on rapid rehousing and the diversion of people at the door of shelters. Focus on results-oriented data collection. In his video message, Secretary Donovan asked for your organizations to focus relentlessly on results and on collecting quality data. Better data is essential to doing more of what works and stop doing what doesn't. We need to focus on quality data collection and point in time counts and an HMIS data entry. We need to seek closer coordination, collaboration with COCs to ensure smarter, more consistent planning between the COC and the con plans in communities and to coordinate ESG funding priorities. And we need to consider lessons learned locally and from national evidence-based research on outcomes to ensure ESG and other program funds are used as effectively as possible. Next slide. Secretary Donovan, in his national video message introducing the rollout of the Emergency Solutions Grant Program, encourage communities to invest in an unprecedented percentage of the, your funding in rapid rehousing. As important as prevention is, he believes that evidence-based research and the experience of HPRP show that we can have the greatest impact on homelessness by helping people who have just fallen into homelessness quickly get back out by rapidly finding long-term living situations for them. We emphasize the Secretary's message in the Substantial Amendment Notice and today because that is how we would like to see communities spend their limited amount of funds. Under HPRP, about 75% of the people assisted were assisted with homeless prevention funds and only 25% with rapid rehousing. A lot of communities ended up creaming or serving people who would not most likely have gone to the shelters or become literally homeless. So we are trying to be crystal clear with ESG. It's a much smaller program, and we believe that communities should target tightly and use the funds as efficiently as possible. And we also know that there are resources for homeless prevention that are accessible through other mainstream programs. So we will hope that you focus on rapid rehousing. 
But if you do decide to do homeless prevention, which I know some people want to do, then you should work to ensure that this assistance goes to those individuals and families who are truly in dire crisis, those who are closest to actually living on the streets or actually entering a shelter. In summary, rapid rehousing programs can effectively transition people out of the homeless assistance system quicker. And it is, easy, it is an easier way to ensure that you're targeting emergency sheltering resources towards individuals and families with the most urgent housing crisis. As public and nonprofit resources become increasingly strained, rapid rehousing should be given the highest priority under ESG. Next slide. Turning to our thoughts about homeless prevention, here is HUD's perspective. If you still have homeless people on the streets and in shelters, why not spend these resources to help people that you know are homeless? Why not use ESG funds to reduce the number of people who are living in shelters and on the streets and reduce the time they have to spend there? That's Secretary Donna's, Donovan's view based upon evidence-based research, and it is our strong feeling as well. We are going to look at the number of persons still on the street and the number of amount of time in shelters engaging COC and ESG program performance and the performance of all 1,192 con-plan jurisdictions performance against their own strategic plans. There is more and more research showing that prevention is very difficult to do effectively. There are many, many individuals and families with very low incomes and with other issues, but it is the small majority who will actually become literally homeless. Research and practical experience in several communities is showing that a small percentage of people who receive homelessness prevention assistance would have actually become homeless. It takes a lot of resources to make any impact on homelessness at that rate. So even if you think that prevention may be working for your community, we want you to take a careful look at your data and consider investing some time into seeing whether it is really preventing homeless, homelessness or just helping people in a housing crisis, who would probably find a way out there themselves without the help of these programs. Next slide. On December 5, 2011, the Interim Regulation for Emergency Solutions Grants Program was enacted along with changes to the Consolidated Plan Regulations. The reason we changed the Con Plan Regulations was to ensure consistency with new requirements in the ESG rule. Also to update the regulation with HUD goals and the opening doors, that is the federal strategic plan to prevent homelessness, and to align it with continuum of care performance measures. It is important to note that changes to the CON plan regulations affect all recipients of CDBG, HOME, HOPWA, and ESG funds, not just ESG recipients. Next slide. Here is an overview of the number of consolidated plan jurisdictions in relationship to the number of those jurisdictions that are ESG recipients. Although only 360 of the consolidated plan jurisdictions actually receive ESG, many of the new requirements in the consolidated plan section on homelessness apply to all 1,192 jurisdictions. I won't go into these in details, but you can see them in a webinar we did on the con plan on HUD HRE. There are 432 separate continuums within these 1,192 jurisdictions. We are actually working on some analysis, including maps of the relationships between COCs and con plan jurisdictions and a subset of the con plan jurisdictions receiving ESG grants, and we hope to publish those in the near future. Next slide. So let's just quickly trace the implications of the COC, ESG, and con plan changes required by HEARTH in the new regulations. First, 
All 1,192 consolidated plan jurisdictions are required to strengthen the needs assessment, inventory of resources, strategy, action plan, and re performance reporting sections of their consolidated plans that address homelessness. Second, all 432 continuous care must now participate in the consolidated plans in their geography. The new regulations provide a more active role for continuums in the process of creating the consolidated plan. Third, 360 jurisdictions that are also ESG recipients and their subrecipients must participate in the continuum's HIMS covering their locations. Finally, 432 continuums of care must provide performance data for ESG-funded projects in their geography. In addition, the continuum of care and the ESG recipient that overlaps their geography must work together to plan the ESG program and to measure its performance. Next slide. I'd like to just uh, preview uh, four changes that occurred in the transportation bill that passed in July 6th of this year. First, environmental reviews were returned to state and local government ESG recipients under Part 58. Second, a metropolitan city and urban county that each receive an ESG allocation and are covered by a single COC may jointly administer ESG under a single grant with HUD permission. Next slide. Local governments may use instrumentalities other than PHAs designated by a chief executive, i.e. the mayor, etc., to act on behalf of the local government's ESG recipient with regard to ESG activities. This includes a combination of general purpose local governments such as an association of governments. States may use instrumentalities designated by the government to act on behalf of the state, but this does not include DC. We are working on a notice to explain both the joint agreement process and the use of instrumentalities. And we should hope to have that out uh, sometime in January. Now over to you, Susan. All right, thank you, Mike. <clears throat> um, now that Mike has spent some time going over the big picture of ESG, I want to get into some of the more detailed requirements. And I've seen some of the questions coming in. I know you guys are just waiting to hear about this nitty-gritty on ESG. So um, there are a lot, as you know, a lot of ESG requirements that are new, but we wanted to spend a little bit of time walking through some of the immediate issues that recipients and subrecipients are facing as you begin to serve people under ESG. And we're not going to spend very much time talking about emergency shelter or HMIS. We're going to spend most of the time talking about homelessness prevention, and rapid rehousing, provision, uh, the provision of rental assistance and services. Um, as John mentioned at the beginning, we have given different versions of this presentation. So um, some of it may be familiar. but uh, And we also had started out giving this as a comparison of HPRP moving into ESG. So there will be some comparisons. Hopefully that will be helpful for you. All right, next slide. So first, I want to start out by um, talking through this cheat sheet that we've prepared to help you understand who can carry out ESG activities. So you can see along the, the left in the first column, there are the five program components of ESG, plus admin, which is an eligible activity but is not technically considered a program component. And at the bottom, you can see the rules that apply to sharing of admin funds. The light gray shading um, outlines the, the rules that apply to state recipients. And the dark gray shading is for metropolitan cities, urban counties, and territories. So for the state recipients, a state agency or an instrumentality of a state, um, now that we have the new legislation, a state agency or instrumentality can only carry out HMIS if the state is the HMIS lead. Also, a state or instrumentality may retain administrative funds. And a state may only subgrant to units of general purpose local government or private nonprofit organizations. And those organizations may carry out all of the component types as shown in the light gray area. 
For metropolitan cities, urban counties, and territories, they can either carry out activities themselves or they can subgrant to private nonprofit organizations. And now they can also use instrumentalities that are designated by the executive, such as a mayor, to run the program. Okay, next slide, please. Another overarching general requirement for the program is that the entire grant must be expended within 24 months of the date of HUD's signature um, on the grant agreement. So that's an important milestone. Um, also, recipients now need to make sure that they're drawing funds down from IDIS at least once per quarter of the fiscal year. Also, recipients must reimburse the subrecipients within 30 days of receipt of their complete payment request. So these are some timeliness um, requirements that we put in place. In some cases, um, you may have heard us say this before, but we learned a lot from HPRP, and a lot of these requirements are in place because of things that we learned through our experience with HPRP. OK, next slide, please. Moving into rental assistance, um, both the homelessness prevention and rapid rehousing components have the same eligible activities, which are rental assistance, financial assistance, and housing relocation and stabilization services. Rental assistance is available for up to three months, which is short-term assistance, or from four to 24 months, which is medium-term assistance. And under HPRP, as you remember, it was only a maximum of 18 months of assistance, and we increased it to 24 months of assistance under ESG in order to make it more consistent with the continuum of care program rule, where um, assistance in transitional housing can be up to 24 months. So ESG also, um, ESG rental assistance, can be for tenant-based assistance or project-based assistance. And again, HPRP was only tenant-based rental assistance. The project-based rules are pretty specific. So if you are considering using ESG for any type of project-based assistance, you want to make sure that you're, using, that you're reading the regs very carefully and that you're contacting your local HUD field office or us if you have questions about it. Next slide, please. I do want to spend another minute talking about the difference between these two types of assistance because we are still getting questions on the help desk and um, I want to make sure it's clear. Tenant-based rental assistance is when the program participant can choose the unit that they're going to live in. And of course, with a lot of times that's with the assistance of the provider. But project-based assistance is when the recipient or the sub-recipient identifies the unit and enters into an agreement with the owner to reserve that unit. Um, another thing to note is that if you are an organization that's serving participants in units that you own, um, you definitely want to make sure you got, watch out for conflicts of interest. And there's a section in the reg, of course, to, that goes over that. But in general, you can't condition any ESG assistance on whether or not someone agrees to live in units that you own. So you can't say, we're only going to provide you this assistance, you know, the BSG assistance, if you live in this particular unit that we own. Okay. Um, also, if you are a subrecipient and you do want to house people in units that you own and they agree to it, um, you can't carry out that initial evaluation. And also, you can't do homelessness prevention in a housing unit that you own. And a lot of that, again, is based on our experience with HPRP. And there's just a, a lot of um, issues that can occur. So um, that's why we put those rules into place. Next slide, please. The other category, as I mentioned, of ESG eligible activities um, is housing relocation and stabilization services. And this is broken out into financial assistance and services. Um, the financial assistance category includes activities that are not rent, including security deposits, utility deposits, utility payments, and moving costs. Um, and I, this is different from how it was under HPRP, so it, maybe like some of you, I know I'm, it's taking me a little bit of time to get used to how it's categorized. Um, but the, we, the reason it's done that way is because in the statute, uh, rental assistance 
is categorized under its own provision. And so that's why we broke rental assistance out in the reg and why financial assistance and services are categorized under housing relocation and stabilization services. Next slide, please. A couple other requirements under homelessness prevention or refugee housing. We have what we call a maximum period of use, which is that the total period for which any program participant may receive the services must not exceed 24 months during any three-year period. So there's a limit on the amount of assistance any program participant can receive. And on top of that, the recipient may set maximum dollar amounts that they want to provide and or maximum time periods of assistance as long as they're, you know, that are, if they're more narrow than HUD's maximum. So the recipients would, if they want to do this, the recipient would need to set those caps in the written standard in their action plan or their substantial amendment. Um, that's in order so that it goes through the citizen participation process. Okay, next slide, please. As with HPRP assistance, eligible participants must have a written lease agreement on file in their case file in order to provide ongoing rental assistance. Um, and that lease must be between the tenant and the landlord. Also note that you cannot do master leasing under tenant-based rental assistance. That is, the subrecipient can't sign the lease and then sublease it out if you're doing TBRA. So what's new, one of the big things um, with ESG is that a, we also require that there's a rental assistance agree agreement between the subrecipient or the recipient and the unit owner or the property manager. So that's another big thing that needs to be on file. And another, actually a question that we've gotten a couple of times is whether a sub-sub recipient has also any responsibility or ability to do this. And I wanted to just point out that sub-sub recipients have the same responsibilities that a sub-recipient does. So same, I guess, limits and responsibilities as a sub-recipient. That's an important distinction to note as well. Next slide, please. So under HPRP, only rent reasonableness, apply, rent reasonableness applied, and I know that when we were out monitoring, um, we spent a lot of time talking about re rent reasonableness and also on our webinars. So with ESG, there's an additional layer, and it also has to meet the fair market rent. So if, it, if the rent reasonableness standard that you do is higher than what the FMR is going to be, you cannot pay rent that is any higher than the FMR max. Okay, so that's a, a new big change that um, I know we've been getting some questions about. Another key requirement, the second bullet on this slide, um, another key requirement when providing homelessness prevention or rapid rehousing assistance um, is this thing that we call in HPRP the cost type rule. And it's not exactly called that in ESG, but it's the same idea, which is that you have to ensure that there's no other public program paying the same cost at the same time as ESG. So for example, the staff that is approving the payment of the rental arrears, let's say, for the month of September 2012, must ensure that there was no other rental assistance payment being made for the rental arrears for that same month of September 2012. And the same thing would go for utilities or um, a security deposit, et cetera. Okay, next slide, please. Another important um, thing that, that the distinction to make that's the difference between HPRP and ESG is that so Habitability standards apply and lead-based paint standards apply, just like they did under HPRP. But under ESG, habitability inspections must be conducted and documented any time any ESG assistance is provided, even if it's just rental arrears, 
or even if you're just providing a little bit of legal assistance to help someone stay in their home. The regulation is written very, very narrowly on this, and we've, um, we've talked it through with our lawyers, and um, there aren't any exceptions that can be made. So um, this is the rule. It's required for all assistance. Um, similarly, lead-based paint, uh, the visual assessment is required for all units receiving ESG assistance. And again, we want to make sure that you're documenting this. This was one of the most consistent findings that we had under HPRP, um, is that people, I think, got confused about when it was required and when it wasn't. And the, as it says on the slide, it's required for all units receiving assistance if they were constructed before 1978 and if a child under the age of six or a pregnant woman is going to be living in that unit. Okay? Um, and and the, we also um, want to make it clear that the visual assessment, um, anybody, can, anybody can conduct that visual assessment as long as they've taken the online training. I believe it's about a 20-minute training. And so you can have your case manager take that training to be able to conduct the visual assessment. You could have a, another city or county employee do it. Um, so it doesn't have to be somebody who's specially certified other than having taken that certification course. That, I believe is fairly brief. Next slide, please. So one of um, the big new program requirements is the need for all providers to use a centralized or coordinated intake assessment throughout the COC in order to conduct the required initial assessment of every program participant who receives assistance. ESG recipients are required to do this once the COC has a coordinated assessment system in place, and now that the COC rule has been issued, I know that COCs are going to be starting, they, I know they are starting to focus on planning this, so ESG recipients do need to be working with their local COCs. Mike has already spent a little bit of time talking about the collaboration with COCs, but I think it, it warrants mentioning again that the statute requires recipients to implement ESG in collaboration with their COC. Um, and we've talked about this. I, uh, like I said before in other webinars, um, but not only is it required by statute, but we, under HPRP, we saw a lot of new collaboration taking place in many communities around the country. We've documented some of those in our HPRP success stories that are posted on the web um, on the HRE right now. And so I, I really hope that that type of collaboration is going to continue under ESG. Um, because it's required, but also because I think it, it, from what we're understanding from communities, it's really helped them move into it, uh, into different innovative ways of providing this assistance and being more effective and efficient with the resources that they have. Um, the third bullet on the slide refers to the written standards, again, which Mike did refer to. These should have been laid out in the substantial amendment for the 2011 second allocation of ESG funds, and in the 2012 action plan. And I know some of you are working on your 2013 action plans as well. So um, hopefully you're continuing to uh, evaluate and refine the standards as you go and as you have a little bit more time and you learn more about what you want to do with ESG in your community. One thing that, a couple questions that we've gotten, um, you can't say in your standards, oh, we're just going to require our subs to come up with standards, So we're just going to require our subrecipients to meet the requirements. And it, the regulation does require more specific written standards than that. And you as the recipient do have a big responsibility to come up with standards that you think are going to work best for your community. And we understand it's a, you know, it's a big responsibility, and we put that in place on purpose, on purpose, again, based on a lot of what we learned in HPRP. For example, I know that um, Sometimes there were HPRP grantees or subgrantees that didn't have their policies and procedures written down. Things weren't being communicated clearly to the subs. So people in a, in a given HPRP grantee's area, different subs were doing different things, different staff people were doing different things, and it, it just um, having those written standards in place makes a much um, clearer and uh, a better process. Okay, so the fourth bullet on this slide 
talks about making sure that you're connecting participants with mainstream resources. Hopefully you're doing that. And the last bullet on the slide refers to making sure that you're um, reevaluating program participants to ensure that, li that the limited ESG funds are going to those um, citizens in the community who need it most. And of course, the frequency of the re-evaluation will depend on the type of services provided. Okay, um, next slide, please. We're not really going to get into um, eligibility here. We have a couple of webinars in the past where we've talked about that at great length. So like I said at the beginning, I'm just talking mainly about the program requirements here. Um, we learned, again, from HPRP that maintaining evidence of program participants' eligibility is sometimes a matter of interpretation at the local level. And a lot of people tend to do this in different ways. So with ESG, we're purposely being more prescriptive with certain things about case management. We're requiring that each program participant have a housing stability plan. We're requiring monthly meetings with the case manager. And we're requiring those referrals to mainstream and other resources. And you want to make sure that you're documenting this in your case files and that evidence of it is, remains in the case files, especially when, um, when you're monitored. Uh, it's also important to note that service providers who also receive funds through the Violence Against Women Act and or the Family Violence Prevention and Services Act cannot require victims of domestic violence to participate in services as a condition of continued participation in the ESG program. Next slide, please. OK, I know you're all dying to know about the CAPER. Um, we've been getting tons of questions about this. I think uh, this requirement has people on their toes. So I want to spend a minute going over it. Um, first of all, the, re the requirement to report in CAPER is a requirement for recipients, just as, as it has always been. ESG does use the CAPER, and we'll continue doing that. Um, there is not going to be a submission in eSNAP, so that hasn't changed. But some of you um, probably noticed that the accomplishment screens in IDIS that used to be there, they're gone now. That was on purpose. Um, we wanted to move towards creating an APR, like an annual performance report, similar to what we did with HPRP and the COC program. But we haven't been able to do it all at once, so we've created what we're calling a transition caper. Some of you may have seen the list of message we sent out where we talked about that. Um, and we've also, I know HUD has done a number of webinars and presentations around the country talking about this new econ planning suite that's in IDIS. And that's the structure that we're using to, um, to present the, the CAPER and to get the data from communities that's in the CAPER. So you know that jurisdictions are required to complete their next consolidated plan in IDIS, the next one that's due after November 15th. And then once they have their consolidated plan in IDIS, they'll complete the following action plan and the CAPER after that. So for ESG, and that's the normal process for communities that don't get ESG. But for ESG, we wanted to jump the gun a little bit. Um, we felt that we needed to be able to report on the uses of HARF funds for ESG. And we wanted to start communities getting used to um, doing this type of reporting that's a little bit more prescriptive and and extensive than what we had been getting for many communities in the CAPER. So here's what the, here's what the instructions tell you. So until your con plan is due, let's assume your con plan isn't in IDIS for another year or two. So just continue to do, you're going to submit your CAPER via the hard copy that you would normally do. And you want to include any ESG information that you want to report on based on what's in your action plan. But what you need to do now, as of October 1st, is complete and submit the screens that are in the ESG caper in IDIS. Then you want to print those screens out and attach them to the paper copy of the caper submission that you're going to be sending in along with your CDBG caper, your home caper, et cetera. Okay. Um, we know that the data from that you're going to be putting into these screens in the CAPER are not all going to come from HMIS right now. 
like I said, it's a transition caper. It's not going to be perfect, and we get that. Um, we've talked to the HMI offenders about it, so I think they understand it. Um, if you have questions about it, you can submit them to the, there's a, actually a new 1CPD help desk that you can submit questions on the caper. Um, you know, I didn't put that resource on here, but um, anyways, it's, it's basically, we're, we're working on some more tools to help you sit with this submission process and a little bit more guidance. So our, our goal, like I said, is to move into a more complete APR in the future. Um, we're not quite there yet, but just do your best until we get there. Okay, next slide, please. So on this next slide, I've actually posted a couple of resources where we have provided some information about what this CAPER process is. The first one is a CPD notice that we put out in, I think it was April 30th, um, where we just mentioned what the requirement was. It was a part of a different uh, a notice where we announced the econ planning suite and what the con plan requirements were. We also have specific guidance on the CAPER screens and completing them in IDIS. It's a big document, and ESG starts at the very, very end. Um, the ESG specific guidance starts on page 213. So you can find that information there, and we're going to be hopefully beefing that, that guidance up as well in that document. And like I said, we're preparing another notice that will give you a little bit more information about this in a formal way. Okay, next slide. So now we're getting into the FAQ portion of this presentation. Next slide. I've got 10 FAQs. And um, we'll start with one that we've gotten a lot of questions about. Um, this FAQ is actually posted on the HRE, so you may have seen it before, but we are still getting lots of questions about it. So I wanted to just walk through it. Also, it's written in sort of a legalese format, and it, um, we, I wanted to walk through it with you. So the first thing is make sure that you read the regulations. I've put the, the regulation sites up on the slide. Match is required. It can be cash or in kind. Um, there are exceptions for territories and for the first $100,000 of state grants, just as it was under the Emergency Shelter Grants Program. OK, federal, state, and local funds can be used. Um, in order for federal funds to be used, the other programs, regulations, or law also have to allow it. But we've gotten some questions about this. It is true, federal funds may be used as match. They're not prohibited. OK, number one, matching funds may be used for ESG and for the recipient or subrecipients allowing allowable costs. But for this reason, food stamps cannot be used as match because the funds are being used to cover the program participant costs, not the recipient or subrecipient costs. Similarly, housing choice vouchers cannot be used as match because those funds are used to pay the PHA's obligations under its um, housing assistance payment or half contract with the owner. And likewise, the tenant's portion of the rent cannot be used as match because this amount is the tenant's obligation. Number two, number two means that the cash match must be used in compliance with the ESG requirements as well as the requirements of the other program. So in other words, to use a very obvious example, you couldn't use cash match, it wouldn't be eligible from a road construction program and spend it on ESG because ESG activities like rental assistance are probably not eligible under a road construction program. So, um, and similarly, you, you couldn't spend cash match on something like car repair because even though it might be eligible under another program, car repair wouldn't be eligible under ESG. Okay. Number three. Uh, next slide, please. Number three, the matching funds have to be contributed after the date that HUD signs the grant agreement, and you need to make sure that you document this. Number four, and I actually think the, yeah, you need to keep clicking, thank you. Um, number four, the, again, the matching funds have to be used in accordance with the ESG rule, which means they have to be expended by the same deadline as for the ESG funds being matched. Number five, <clears throat> the funds you use for cash match may only be used to match ESG, and you, that means you can't double count the funds. 
Number six, the cash match can only go one way. You can't use, for example, you can use TANA funds to match ESG and then use ESG funds to also match TANA. And number seven, you need to make sure that you're documenting your match. So this goes back to ensuring that you're spending it in accordance with the ESG requirements and in a timely manner. Also, another question that we've gotten, um, you don't have to match ESG funds on an activity by activity basis. The match is on the total grant amount. So for example, let's say you're spending $10,000 on HMIS. You don't have to find $10,000 in data collection expenses from somewhere else to try to match it. You can use um, you know, a shelter cost to, to match HMIS because the match is on the total grant amount. Okay? All right, next slide. FAQ number two. This is also uh, an FAQ that has been posted, so hopefully you've seen it, but I'm still going to walk through it. The question is, can a transitional facility receive ESG funds? The answer is, ESG funds are allowable only for emergency shelters. But a transitional facility can be eligible to receive ESG funds if it actually is defined as an emergency shelter. So if it meets the following criteria under the new emergency shelter definition. So A, the primary purpose has to be to provide a temporary shelter for the homeless or in general or for specific populations. And B, if it, that shelter does not require occupants to sign leases or occupancy agreements. The other way that a transitional facility could be eligible to receive ESG funds is if it receives funds under a fiscal year 2010 ESG grant and met the criteria under the former emergency shelter definition, which is listed there. So this is um, the, the grandfathering in clause that we've allowed um, transitional facilities to remain eligible to receive ESG funds through that way. So Hopefully that, oh, um, and you know what, can you please hit the next slide button so that people can see the answer? Okay, sorry about that. I'll give you a minute to absorb the answer there. This was actually done, like I said, this presentation was done uh, for a live presentation that I gave, and I had, was hitting those slides myself. Okay. All right, the next slide, please. So the question is, when are ESG subrecipients required to start entering data in HMIS? And the answer is, as soon as possible. So the requirement is that providers need to start entering data in, into HMIS as soon as they begin serving people using funds from the second allocation of ESG. And if you didn't get second allocation funds as a provider, um, as soon as you start getting the next allocation of ESG funds, whether it's FY12 or beyond. And another important note is that domestic violence providers must use a comparable database, and that comparable database must meet the data standards, and you must collect all of the universal data elements. We've gotten a few questions um, asking if they really have to collect everything, and the answer is yes, they really have to collect all of the data elements to the best of their ability. Next slide, please. Another question that we've gotten a lot is whether ESG funds can be used to pay for expenses like office rent, photocopiers, office supplies, staff time, and things like that. So the answer is yes. Um, these types of expenses can be charged either directly or indirectly to a program component. So you would charge them to the activity for which the funds are being used. And the example is that office rent for an organization, let's say you have a, a subrecipient that's only doing rapid rehousing activities, you can charge the office rent to rapid rehousing, you can charge your pens and computers um, and staff time to rapid rehousing because all that staff is doing rapid rehousing and you, would, you could charge it directly or indirectly. 
Now, if you have an activity that is not a direct cost of delivering services or financial assistance, or rental assistance, actually, and it is a cost required for administering the program, then it could be charged to the admin line item. And if you look at the, the regulation is at 576.108 in the interim rules under administrative expenses where it says the recipient may use up to 7.5% of the ESG grant for the payment of administrative costs related to planning and execution of ESG activities. Um, this does not include staff and overhead costs directly related to carrying out activities eligible under Part 576.101 through Part 576.107 because these costs are eligible as a part of those activities. You may want to take the reg and reread that again. And then underneath that is listed all of the allowable administrative activities. So we're actually, uh, we've, like I said, we've gotten a lot of questions about this. We are working on um, providing a, a fairly extensive guidance document to go over a number of examples about how this can be done. Um, but just know that in general, yes, you can pay for these things, and in general they should be charged to, the program, to either admin or it's the program component that makes the most sense. Next slide, please. So this is a hot topic. Um, can subrecipients can recipients subgrant to a, a public housing agency? And the answer is no. Um, and HUD may not issue waivers as it did with HPRP because under ESG it's statutory. Um, there's another part of this answer. If you can keep hitting, there you go. <clears throat> Actually, a couple more parts of this answer, please. Yep. So under only PHAs that are units of general purpose local government may receive ESG funds, and that is a fairly rare situation. The staff of the housing authority would have to be city staff or county staff, and I think that it only happens in certain places. Um, you can also see um, that the interim rule explicitly permits recipients who are not states to carry out all eligible activities through their employees, through procurement contracts, or through subgrants to private nonprofit organizations. If you choose to procure any organization, you do need to make sure that you're following the requirements of 85.36 in 24 CFR. Um, and the rules are laid out here. I think we're breaking every rule of PowerPoint presentations here with these FAQs. There's a lot of text on that slide. Um, so take a moment to think it over, to look it over and think it over. And um, I want to point out that this is, you know, this is all in the regulations at 24 CFR Part 85.36. So um, there's nothing in here that's been changed, you know, in the procurement regulations by ESG. Next slide, please. Um, the question is, for ESG, are we required to keep a record of all the clients that we screened who are ineligible? And the answer is yes. The ESG record keeping and reporting requirements state that for each individual and family determined ineligible to receive ESG assistance, the record must include documentation of the reason. <clears throat> And um, also note that the data doesn't have to be entered into HMIS. It can be if you want to, if that's the way you're using your HMIS, but it's, it's not a HUD requirement. But the recipients are going to be the ones, I think, that make that decision. Next slide, please. Frequently asked question number seven. This is another question that we've already, I believe, posted, but again, we keep getting questions about it, so I want to make sure I spend time going through it. What portion of a recipient's fiscal year ESG award can be used for street outreach and emergency shelter activities? And the regulations at Part 576.100 state that the total amount of a recipient's fiscal year grant that may be used for street outreach and emergency shelter activities combined cannot exceed greater of either 60% of the recipient's fiscal year grant or the amount of FY10 grant funds committed for homeless assistance activities. 
and that amount includes all homeless assistance activities from fiscal year 2010, not just shelter activities or street outreach. Okay, next slide, please. Does the 30% area median income limit apply to all applicants for ESG assistance? And the answer is no. Um, for emergency, shelter, and street outreach components, you don't have to do an income assessment. Um, it's assumed that if you are staying in emergency shelter, if you are on the street, sleeping on the street and receiving street outreach, um, you know, you're probably there, not there by choice. Um, for rapid rehousing assistance, an income assessment is not required at initial evaluation. However, at annual reevaluation, the income must be less than or equal to 30% AMI. Okay? Um, and then for homelessness prevention assistance, households have to have an income that is below 30% AMI at the initial evaluation, and they have to have no other housing options, financial resources, or support network. And at the reevaluation, which must take place not less than once every three months, the participant must have an annual income less than or equal to 30% AMI. So as you can see, these um, requirements are graded and, you know, from the lowest standard of, of eligibility through the highest standard of eligibility and documentation, which is under homelessness prevention. Next slide, please. All right, we're in the home stretch. Two more questions. And again, a lot of text on this slide, but really what this is saying is, what do you have to keep in a case file for ESG? We haven't spent a lot of time on this, on this particular presentation talking about documentation. Um, we did spend a lot of time talking about documentation with HPRP and working with grantees and providing TA around it. Um, it is no less important under ESG to make sure you're getting your documentation of eligibility on, and assistance provided and keeping that in the case files. Um, we are providing, we're working on some TA tools and, and guidance for you here. But basically, so this, this um, question definitely only grazes the surface of documentation, and, and I get that. But I wanted to point out here that the regulation does lay out some minimum, minimum acceptable evidence for documentation of, of um, eligibility under the homeless definition and at risk. The order of priority that we're looking for is the first and highest level of documentation of eligibility, a third party documentation. The second one is observations of intake workers. And lastly, self-certification from the person seeking assistance. Um, the minimum acceptable, I'll just read this, the minimum acceptable types of documentation vary according to the, the particular circumstance. Um, and, you know, like I said, it, it does depend on, um, on the, like I said, the particular circumstance. Third-party documentation should be obtained whenever possible, but we understand that it's not always going to be possible. Okay, next slide. This brings us to FAQ number 10. If an ESG case manager learns that a program participant's annual income has increased and now exceeds 30% AMI, must the recipient or subrecipient immediately stop providing assistance to the program participant? And the answer is that it's up to the recipient or subrecipient who may require each program participant to notify the recipient or the subrecipient regarding any changes. Um, but this it's up to them to require it. It's not a HUD requirement. But if, you, if the recipient or subrecipient has required such a notification, in that case, then the recipient or subrecipient must reevaluate the person's eligibility for the program at that point. So HUD's not requiring it, but if you're requiring it, when you, you hear about a um, a change in income or household composition that's going to affect their eligibility, then you have to do a reassessment at that point. So that's basically what that is saying. Um, and that actually brings us to the end of my presentation.
So with that, I will hand it over to John to discuss some of HUD resources of the HUD resources available. And actually, I want to I want to point out also we're going to be posting these FAQs on the HRE um, shortly within the next few days. So we might post uh, slightly expanded versions of them. I had to compress it to get them on the slides. But in any case, John, um, passing it back over to you to finish the webinar. Okay. Thank you, Susan, and thank you, Michael. Uh, yeah, as Susan mentioned, there are additional resources regarding the ESG program that you can find on the HUD HRE Info website, including the published ESG interim rule with consolidated plan changes, the consolidated plan regulation, which highlights changes from the ESG interim rule, uh, the ESG help desk, which uh, you can find by going to the HUD HRE help desk and then selecting the ESG program. And finally, the webinar recordings and slides related to ESG. Next slide, please. Again, if you submitted a question that we did not answer in this webinar, be sure to submit it through the virtual help desk. And be sure to reference the title of this webinar when you do. Next slide, please. Finally, please complete the online survey to tell us how well this webinar met its objectives. Also, we're excited to begin offering attendees of this webinar and all future Ready, Set, Go webinars the ability to mark this course as complete in the learning management system so that you can add it to your learning transcript. You'll receive a link via email to complete both later today. So looking forward, we hope you'll join us October 23rd for the next webinar in the series titled Annual Homeless Assessment Report, AHAR, Part 2, steps to a successful data submission. And that concludes this webinar. Once again, on behalf of the SNAPS office, thank you for attending and enjoy the rest of your day.